In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My Lord and my God, I firmly believe that you are here, that you see me, that you hear me. I adore you with profound reverence. I ask your pardon for my sins and the grace to spend this time of prayer fruitfully. My Immaculate Mother, Saint Joseph, my Father and Lord, my Guardian Angel, intercede for me. These days, we have been doing our prayer, contemplating, meditating on the contents of what in sacred scripture is known as the prophets. Prophets, as we had occasion in the past to consider, were not people who predicted the future. They did that too, but that was not their main function. The word prophet, coming from the Greek prophet Kazain, means to teach a teacher. So a prophet, more than anything else, is a teacher, a spokesperson for somebody else. And here it's very clear who they were a spokesperson for. It was God. God revealing to man what only with a lot of difficulty man would discover for himself and only imperfectly. And what is that? Not only the what of the universe around him and the what of himself. What is this? What am I? Not even the how. How did this come about? Who can possibly say exactly what happened before? The geology up to now are still just coming up with hypotheses and perhaps even tested out to become theories of the origin of the universe. The scientists, the Big Bang theory, because of what they have observed in nature. First of all, the first law of thermodynamics, that the summation of mass plus the summation of energy in the whole universe is constant, it's not changing. So in other words, everything that is in the universe in terms of matter and energy because those two things are interchangeable. Matter is nothing but compressed energy. That's why E, energy, equals mc squared. M is mass. C, it's the speed of light squared. That's the famous equation of Einstein. That's the equation behind the atomic bomb, nuclear uh, fission and fusion. So therefore, if mass has not been changing, so it's been that way since it came about. It's not as if that the creation of the mass and the energy of the universe or the appearance thereof had been a, shall we say, a stepwise process. No, everything was there, not in that form exactly, but the totality of mass and energy has been constant from the time of its appearance. So think of it. At T minus one, meaning to say at the moment of the appearance of all of that, which is all of that, then just before that, what was there? In the physical scientists would call it nothing. There was nothing there. No, from nothing, nothing comes. From nothing, how come <laughs> everything all of a sudden became? The nothing that they're speaking of, of course, is the nothing of matter, the nothing of the physical sciences, nothing in terms of nothing measurable, nothing observable. But that was not nothing. Because before the creation of the universe, there always has been God in his eternity. And he created it. And from the moment he created it, time began. So there was no before creation. Because before implies succession implies passage from potency to act, implies time precisely. And before time, there was no time, just the eternity of God. So it's not even a before. There's no way to express it precisely. We grope for words for that reality because we have never had anything like that in reality. And we don't have the word for it. We don't have the concept for it either. That's what metaphysics does. It's exciting. Uh, area of knowledge which is beyond physics, beyond the observable, beyond the quantifiable, beyond the formulatable. 
Well, if man is going to understand himself, not only the what and the how, but more importantly, even is the why, why, why? That famous question of St. John Paul II to those students in that Advent Mass that I attended in 1980 as a young graduate student, taking up, finishing up my theological studies in Rome there in St. Peter's, together with 40,000 other university students. Ur Omo, he said, slatin, why man? Why man? And the answer, we have repeated this idea several times here because it's important that we get it. And it not only is a, a matter of knowledge, information, but it really informs us, our being. It becomes a principle of our actions, of all our thinking, as a matter of fact. Hur Omo. Why man? And it had to be God to reveal it. And he said, from the very first book of sacred scripture, the very first chapter of Genesis, God made man to his image. And in chapter two, breathe into him his own spirit so that he becomes his likeness. What for? To be it, then we have to go to the New Testament. We have to go to uh, the epistle of St. Paul, to the Ephesians. You have to go to that passage where it says, he chose us in him before the foundation of the world. You can almost picture the Blessed Trinity meeting, having taking counsel and then formulating the game plan for creation. He chose us in him. He conceptualized us. He thought of us even before starting the whole creative process. He chose us in him to be holy and spotless in his presence in love. Because my brothers and sisters, again, let's consider this. Of what use is creation for a God who is already complete, who is fulfilled, who is infinite, and is not even alone because it's a, a trinity of persons. If God created, it's not because he needed to, but because he wanted to. But then why would he want to? To have a universe full of planets and, 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 and all kinds of heavenly bodies? Or even in within the one planet, or perhaps there are even several but scientists would be saying that there would be trees and, 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 and plants and all kinds of microorganisms and bigger organisms, reptiles and mammals, etc. for all of that. Imagine a world, or even many worlds, even better than the earth in terms of ecology. All of that will be worthless as far as God is concerned. Why? <laughs> it's like you, you know, I really pity people who have collections of things, you know, collections of gems, collections of Gucci bags, collections of all kinds of collections, and then they look at them. And then, since they're very expensive, then they can't really bring them out. So they're kept in, in vaults and all kinds of things. And what for? Okay, fine. I can imagine uh, people like that going to their collections and admiring those gems, those watches, those paintings, or for somebody else, a big garage with cars. And once in a while, even driving them, whatever driving they can do, especially in the Philippines, there's not many places where you can drive those things. And then what? The spiritual creature, for not to say the spiritual being who is God, is not made for material things. There's a reason why the same St. John Paul too at a given moment would say in that lecture, it was a lecture. It was a homily addressed to 40,000 students in the St. Peter's Basilica that Advent Sunday of 1980. At a given moment, would say, and I can never forget these words. I don't even lose the sound of it in my, in my memory. That voice of, by then, I still 
quite young, John Paul II, with a powerful voice, with a powerful uh, baritone. Who Romo? Why man? And then he said, in a given moment, just one thought of the spiritual being, the spiritual creature, just one thought of man is worth more than the whole material universe put together. Wow, that's really quite an affirmation. It's metaphysics. The physical scientists will be hard put to understand that statement. Because you have to understand that there's a hierarchy in being. And matter and energy, the physical world, is a dimension which is inferior, vastly inferior to the spiritual realm. And we are spiritual beings. Yes, we have a body. Yes, we have a body that needs material support. But we have a spiritual soul. We can think and we can love. And that thinking process and that loving process is well nigh infinite. That's why St. John Paul II would say, just one thought of man is worth more than all the material universe put together. And that is why only God is worthy of him. Okay, where you find the meaning of our existence. Why man? Why did God create the spiritual uh, beings, the spiritual creatures, first the angels and then man, to be with him? That is a destiny, it's a spiritual creature. It's as if God wanted to share his goodness by creating beings, creatures, who can share it with him. But how can they share it with him, that joy, if they can't even think, if they can't love. And that's what happens with it. all the material universe, that all that vastness and that variety of beings that one can imagine or can observe. All of those, they can't relate to God. That's why the example I said earlier of the collectors, they can relate with their collection. They can admire them. They can measure them. They can study them. They can appreciate their beauty even. But those creatures cannot relate back. The plantito and the plantito who talks to his or her plants, or the pet owners who talk to their pets, and would even make them their, um, shall we say, their heirs to their properties. That's an exercise in futility. Only an intelligent being can be a subject of rights of ownership, everything else are owned by man, are possessed by man, are even annihilated by man if it wants to. And there's a reason why when people lose track of this, then they come up with all kinds of pathetic. I was about to say funny, but it's not funny at all because it's pathetic. Conserving nature, quote unquote, or eating the rainforest. Have you ever seen any person eating rain rainforest? <laughs> Maybe the panda uh, would eat some of it, some bamboo shoots. But but even if we consume the whole rainforest, which we won't do because we're so few, we're so little compared to the vastness of the ecosystem of the whole earth. But even if we did that, then there would be other planets out there where we can extract things from. Why? Because God created things that way. We are at the top of the material universe. All the material universe are for our support. But then we go back to the old question. But what are we for? Or Oma. And our destiny is to be with God. God created the universe that way. God created man that way. With him in paradise. The whole idea of paradise was that man, Adam and Eve, and their um, descendants were supposed to live in, 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 in that paradise existence. They're just in that small portion of paradise uh, somewhere there in Mesopotamia. But of what will happen afterwards? Imagine a world don't I need to imagine it. I mean, you see it right now. This world of ours, had Adam and Eve not fallen, then you would have all of us living in a paradisical way. Meaning to say, in harmony, 
loving God, following his will, respecting his grand design, making better use, therefore, of the material universe because we're in sync with the grand design. Don't think that God wanted the universe as it looked like in paradise, period, with all of us traipsing around naked and subject to the elements, although at that time all the elements were sub were adjusted perfectly so that man could go around naked without any problem. But even allowing for the ingenuity of man, applying his intellect to the material universe and educing from it all the goodness that it contains and it's, that, that it's possible of, so that we have a world with all the technology, the advances of science, etc., etc. But imagine that subservient to God's laws. In sync, therefore, with each other. That is paradise. That was the plan. The only thing is God derailed. As we had so often considered, God is good. You, my Lord, created the universe with a divine plan full of love. You loved everything into existence. And not even man's perfidy could really derail your plan. Man derailed himself and the material universe around him in the process. But you, my Lord, are God. You are the God of creation. So even then, even before that, in your eternity, you already knew how human freedom was going to play out and you already established a remedy. And that remedy is redemption. That remedy is salvation history. What a wonderful thing this is. Salvation history. Ever since the fall of man, the fate of the material universe, including him, has been salvation history. If the plan of God was derailed, quote-unquote, italics, by he who is going to be at the apex of the material creation, who is man, then one can understand that thereafter, divine providence would be engaged in a gigantic effort to reel back man into the fold because he chose us in him before the foundation of the world that we may be holy and spotless in his presence in love. And that's the way we have to read human history. It's not just a concatenation of events that every now and then a megalomaniac like, like, like Alexander the Great or a Genghis Khan or, or, or a Napoleon or a Hitler or for that matter of our um, recent history, all of these people that we see in the newspapers nowadays, they're not the real shakers and movers of history. In a certain sense, they're almost like pawns in the grand game of chess that the Blessed Trinity is playing. Ludens in orbitararum, et delitium esse filiominum, playing in the confines of the earth. And was, my delight was to be with the children of men. But like any other repair job, like any other um, shall we say, putting out of fires, he's not going to be a walk in the park, especially if the fire has been ca caused by people who have a free will. And that's why it's taking so long for salvation history to play itself out. God knew that too. It will play out at the end of time. And when that will be, we don't know. But meanwhile, we have to learn how to read history from that optic, from that vantage point, because otherwise, then we feel ourselves victims of circumstances. Last night, or not last night, but last weekend, uh, I was in a get-together of some parents. Actually, it was a, a garden party of the, of the youth club. And the parents were around. Very pleasant environment because the young chaps had put together a show, so to speak, with games and all of that. It was the awardings night 
of the Lantaka uh, youth club. And so the, the kids were there, the parents were there, the rest of the family were there. It was such a pleasant thing in the garden. Well, anyway, I, I had other things to do. And so I joined them quite more than midway through the, the affair. And uh, it was, the program was already ongoing and I just sat by, I mean, sat on the table of a family people who I knew from from before. And the the uh, the lady was telling me, you know, Father, this pandemic has been good to us. This pandemic has been good to us. Because really, all of that thing that was happening before our eyes at night, the gelling of the youth club, how the boys were so in sync with each other, so much confidence, even with the little ones, all of that was the result of the the what had been going on in that youth club in the past two years. And that was what she was saying, that in all of this, we somehow had managed not only to survive, but to thrive. And a great part of it is thanks to the youth club, because we know what our children are doing. They're in good hands, and they're not cooped up. In, in our house because there are other activities because the youth club had been functioning all this time. They've been going on excursions, they've been going on uh, youth camps, etc., etc. all this time, this past two years. That this pandemic had been good to us. My brothers and sisters, if we're in sync with God, because we're prayerful, because we talk with you, my Lord, on a daily basis, 24-7, all throughout the day, then everything will be good for us. We will never be victims of circumstances, but rather players, and not just players, players who have been provided for with the grand plan, with all the wherewithals, both the hardware and the software, not only to survive, but to thrive. Paradise was lost, yes, but with this with the redemption, with the passion and death of our Lord Jesus Christ, in principle, we had been redeemed. And that is why when, you know, people botch up their lives, it's really a tragedy. Because then they would have done that despite everything that God had done for them. That they would have made a mess despite the price that Jesus Christ had had to pay in order to set things aright and renew all things in him. Can you imagine what a humongous blunder that is? What an exercise in futility. Yes, but what? Pardon the word for it because there's no other word for it. It's stupidity it is for man. Keep on blundering things despite the fact that everything is already laid out in front of him. And that's why things happen. The first reading of today's Mass, taken from the prophet Isaiah. You see there Isaiah talking to the chosen people, forewarning them about the impending disaster because of their profligate. It was a moment, it was a, a, an age of bonanza for the chosen people that we had been considering these past days, there was a period when the, the, the bigger empires, the, the Assyrians, the Babylonians were in decline. And so therefore, the, the, the kingdoms at the fringes of those empires, of those uh, big kingdoms, were being left at peace. They were not being conquered because uh, there was not enough power to conquer them. And so they were thriving. And one of those was Palestine. Interesting. You know, that forsaken place out there, so to speak, as far as those big empires were concerned. But instead of precisely progressing in their destiny as a chosen people, now that they were at peace, now that they were not um, under tension from, from foreign domination, instead of growing, well, they were falling into idolatry, which is really... <laughs> The plight of man, I always say, if in the state of original justice, if in paradise where everything was in sync and everything was paradise, 
Adam and Eve could do something wrong, forsaking all that plan of God in order to try things out by themselves. Playing God, determining, establishing good and evil, changing the rules of the game. If they could do that, I forgot to say, if the angels, pure spirits, elevated to the supernature because of the indwelling of God in them, just like our first parents. If the angels could do what they did, some of them at least, and became devils, then really we, poor we, with our fallen nature, with the scars of original sin, with the bad influence of other people as well, the structures of sin, is, is it really any wonder why we do some things or the things that we're doing? But this is the wrong. For those who don't do that, for those who struggle to keep on track, to be prayerful, then I was really moved by what this lady was saying. Mm -hmm. The lady, a mother of five, and you can see the children, they're really thriving. Even the youngest one, uh, <laughs> on stage together with the bigger guys it was up to their waist only but with so much confidence so much elan a typical child who is loved who is confident of himself who has grown up in the right environment no hang-ups whatsoever not uh, an iota of a hang-up and I remember that mother his mother when she was a student in the university. Mm -hmm. um, and now she's a mother of five. I don't know how there are many there. I think they're five. Well, saying that with all candor, with all simplicity, but it, because humility is truth. You don't have to downplay the blessings that God has given you. And he said this, this pandemic has been good to us. That instead of suffering, instead of just surviving, we had thrived in it. I really, I couldn't help but think and say, that's what happens when you play by the book. That's what happens when you follow the will of God. Because of course God wants the best for us. What mother, what father, what parents wouldn't want the best for their children? And God wanted the best for us. That's why he placed us in paradise. And even after that fall, then he was willing to pay the price, the passion and death of our Lord on the cross. Oh my God. When are we going to learn this beautiful lesson, this consoling truth? Which doesn't mean to say that there won't be any suffering, there won't be any cross. It can be like the Jews who measured the blessing of God by the um, material well-being. Because it can happen that the will of God is for us because of the overall picture. Because we're not the only elements in this great drama of the human race of salvation history. There are other people. And it com in the combination of all of these players, it may be that our role, our optimal role, is to suffer physically. To suffer materially so that the overall equation the bottom line would be positive for all the rest. It can happen that way. But even then, the person who is pray prayerful will recognize the signs of the times and will find in that otherwise, humanly speaking, negativity or negative factors, something fruitful. If the grain of wheat does not fall to the ground and die, it remains unfruitful. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. So for that person, even that physical, material, temporal reverse or reverses, those reverses would be counted as blessings. That's how much power there is to prayer. That's, much, that's how much power there is to the person who is in sync with his creator and therefore in sync, not only with humanity, but the whole universe. And I insist, these are not, I don't know what, this is not a pep talk or Consuelo de Bobo. On the contrary, it's the coming to terms 
with our destiny and playing our role in it actively. Never being victims of circumstances, but being Lord of our environment. Not Lord as in lording it over, but better term for it would be the priests of our own existence. With that downward motion of the priesthood, which is a channel for the will of God in order to form and inform creation. And that upward motion, which is after having purified it and after having, shall we say, uh, established the kingdom of God in our environment, no matter what that environment is, and to offer it up. In odorum suavitatis, in the sweet odor of incense. That is the meaning of our existence. And isn't that exciting, my brothers and sisters? Then how can so anybody feel victim? Yes, we're victims in the sense of we're an offering, we're a holocaust, but not victimized. Because we offer ourselves freely. We are not sacrificed by anybody else, not just by the environment. We sacrifice ourselves. We are priests of our own existence. And because of that, we are priests of the whole creation. We have to end. I wanted to do this prayer following the liturgy of the word of today. But in the process of introducing it, so that we understand the, the flow. We got into this. This is what happens when we talk with God. This is what happens when we go into supernatural considerations. The mysteries of our faith are mysteries, precisely. Remember what the word mystery means. It's not a puzzle, but rather it's so rich in content. And there's a reason why many times it's mysterious, because we can't quite plumb the depth of it. But if we do, and that's what we do when we pray, then really, there's so many things that we discover. So spend a few minutes on your own. Concretize all these considerations. Find out the concrete application in your lives, not just in general, but today. How are you going to play your role? How are you going to be a protagonist in the history of salvation that is today and then live it out to the full with the joy and the freedom of the children of God and our blessed mother will be there smiling the way parents like that mother I was talking to you about earlier would look at the children and smile and say yes we're thriving in this pandemic yes we're thriving in your divine plan my lord Thank you.